Um, so being the ninth, we've had a lot of great speakers. We have had eight really, really great speakers so far this evening. And uh, based on everything that they've told us, everything that they've pointed out in this TEDx conference uh, themed future world, the future looks really, really bright. You know, we've got all these new ideas circulating around. We've got paths to the future, better education, better data mining, better everything. Um, we got a few problems though. We've got a few problems to deal with. Uh, you can't basically uh, open, turn on the television, open a newspaper, open a browser, whatever, without seeing that there are a lot of events that are complicating things in the world. And I don't want to be a downer about that. But um, we've got a few things to figure out. Um, one of the really, really interesting things that um, we're dealing right now is with an enemy and not an enemy of, of a nation or that we can see on a map or something like that, but an enemy that we actually can't see at all. And it's kind of funny because here in this golden age of biotechnology and disease, tech, uh, uh, disease detection and whatnot, we are dealing with an enemy that we cannot see. And what we've got here on these monitors is um, a very, very recent uh, news article from CBC telling us that uh, we've got measles ransacking the nation. Uh, it's making its way through swaths of Ontario, through Quebec, uh, BC, coming to, coming to uh, BC from, from an Air China flight, uh, in, in he headed to Vancouver, and um, we're having trouble dealing with it. But it's not that we're having trouble dealing with measles per se. It's that we have a way of combating measles and a lot of other diseases for decades now. We've had a vaccine for measles for about 52, 53 years now, a proven vaccine. And a lot of people simply don't want to use vaccines in this day and age. They have no interest in getting themselves immunized. They have no interest in getting their children immunized uh, for whatever reason, um, whether it's their own beliefs or what they've been taught or what they've heard from Jenny McCarthy or whatever the case may be, they are very, very averse to proven, scientifically proven, published therapeutics that could prevent suffering, that could, in many, many cases, save their lives. So as I say, vaccination, I mean, the, the, the vaccine for measles itself, it's been around for 50 years. 60, 63, something like that, was when it was discovered in the United States, when it was created in the United States at the National Institutes of Health. Um, it's been around, and the actual prospect of immunization, of vaccination in and of itself. Anyone have any idea how long immunization has been around? The actual concept. Anyone want to throw out a number in, in number of years? 120? How, how, what, how much? 120. Uh, you're on the right path. We're actually going to about 200 years now. Um, vaccination was a method that was created, a uh, method that was perfected, if discovered, if you will, um, in the late 18th century, around 1789, 1790, by uh, an Englishman named uh, Edward Jenner. And uh, the inaugural vaccine was actually using cowpox, which is the cow variant of smallpox. And the methods were a bit unrefined at the time. Um, Jenner literally took the contents of cow pustules, so basically blisters, sores, pussing sores on the cow's skin, drew up the contents of those cow pustules, and then injected them kind of unrefined and unpurified into people. Um, so people actually had cow pus being injected into them to inoculate them from uh, smallpox, which, which would have been the human variant of cowpox. I'm sure that right now you're thinking that you're glad you've already eaten because I'm sure your appetites are gone at this point, having heard that. The funny thing is, is that as you can see sort of at the lower right of this image montage here, We've got an actual caricature, not a cartoon from the Ottawa Citizen or the Montreal Gazette, but what, have, what, what would have been at the time a, a caricature of the period depicting the common people's reaction to this in that they thought if they were going to be vaccinated by something coming from a cow, 
they were actually going to begin growing cow appendages, cow hooves, cow heads, cow whatever, cow skin, cow tails. They actually thought that. And this was 200 years ago. So people back in the day had kind of an averse reaction to, or, or, or an aversion to the prospect of being vaccinated. Flash forward 200 years later, and we've got people thinking that the actual vaccines or the adjuvant in vaccinations are going to cause autism or going to cause developmental delays in their children or whatever. So, I mean, with that, I don't want to ask for a show of hands necessarily, but think to yourselves, how many of you are averse to a method that has been around for 200 years? If not yourselves, do you know someone? Do you know any actual members, participants in the anti-vaxxers movement right now? Um, what are your thoughts surrounding that kind of mentality? And how does that relate to what you see 200 years ago, people thinking that they would actually begin growing cow appendages? Take those thoughts and I want you to compartmentalize them for just a second. I want to move forward to another recent news article, this particular one. You may, have recognized, you may recognize this. This is actually from, uh, from CBC News as well. Uh, not terribly long ago, we are looking at something from February 13th, um, so less than a month ago. And this bright man here at Dalhousie University has actually invented the prototype, the preliminary stages, of a tattoo removal cream, a cream that can actually remove tattoos. Now this time I'm, I am gonna ask for audience participation. So, by a show of hands, how many of you have some tattoos? I was expecting more, admittedly, okay. Um, of those of you who have tattoos, how many of you have tattoos that in some way represent some connection to a significant other? Well, there goes my line of questioning, okay. <laughs> What I, what I would have then asked had there still been some hands in the air is, how many of you are still with significant said other for whom the tattoo was inked on your body? And I was hoping someone was still gonna- That train of thought is gone, it's all good. Anywho, the point being, um, you no longer have to worry about any body art that you may have gotten, which you no longer now want to deal with. Um, okay, regardless, let's pocket that. Regardless of how many of you do have tattoos, hypothetically, if you did have a tattoo, even those of you who don't, if you did have a tattoo, how many of you, by show of hands, could conceive of using a tattoo removal cream such as this that was invented? You get a tattoo and you wanna remove it. Okay, a fair bit of hands in the air. Keep them up for a minute, if you will, okay? I want everyone to take a look around. See all of these people who have got their hands in the air, okay? All of you who have your hands in the air, you are all crazy, okay? And here's why, okay? There are some people that were thinking, perhaps what we think of them for not wanting to embrace vaccines that have been around for over 200 years. Those of you who had your hands in the air are willing to embrace a new therapeutic that has been announced in the media for less than a month. You don't know what it does. You don't know how it works. You don't know what side effects there are going to be. You use it on day one and by day seven the tattoo's gone. What's going to, what that, what's that cream gonna do to you on year one, on year 10? What are the long-term the long chronic side effects of what that's gonna do? And as someone who's taught immunology and toxicology, I can look a little deeper into here, into that article, how it works. And without actually reading any data, without dealing uh, with, with any of the hardcore information, because I don't have that, um, I can see that the tattoo cream, the, the tattoo removal cream actually works by targeting macrophages. What are macrophages? Macrophages are immune cells that in some way have some sort of relationship with tattoo ink molecules uh, in, in the skin layers. Um, so this cream actually targets, by targets we mean attacks, kills immune cells. How many of you still want to use the cream? Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got something here that a whole bunch of you were on board with using a moment ago, 
and not really knowing what it does. And now we know that it actually attacks cells based on this, how it works. Uh, attacks cells of the immune system. Let's pocket that. Let's put that aside. Now we've got people that we see in the news headlines that are dropping like flies because of drug overdoses. We've moved from people who want nothing to do with something that has been scientifically proven for 200 years to do good and very, very little, if any, harm. We've got a bunch of people jumping on the bandwagon of something that's been announced in the media for less than a month. And now we've got people who are using and abusing drugs, narcotics, illicit, illegal drugs that have been known since the days of opium dens, things like that, fentanyl, the uh, drug that caused the overdose in question, fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. We've known about opium, opium dens and the harmful effects that can come from opiates, again, for centuries. Here's a population of people now who are entering into drug use and drug abuse for something. They're putting something, as opposed to the anti-vaxxers, something that, that is good for them, something that will help them, population willing to use something that will do them harm. How do you reconcile these three examples of populations and more? I don't know, psychology is one of the courses I haven't taught, as opposed to all the ones that I have taught. I'm not a sociologist, I'm not a psychologist. We can ask some other people in the room, some of the other speakers, but it's tough because do they overlap anyway, these three examples? Are they separate? Are they distinct from each other? Now, how do you solve these kinds of problems? How do you say to a population of a country, you've got to start taking vaccines before we get a measles epidemic on our hands? What's the solution? Do you resort to education at a very, very young age? Do you try and teach the children of these people who refuse vaccines that this kind of thing is necessary. We, we need to do this to keep you healthy, to actually keep you alive. Do we set up free vaccination programs, vaccine mobiles? Do we influence the media to report on the positives of vaccination and immunization in kind of the way that they leapt before they looked with the tattoo removal cream? Do we, do we tell people at, at CBC or at CTV, wherever, please report a little more on the positives of vaccine so that we don't have measles rampaging the country. Do we actually put it into law? Do we make this, while we're on the subject of criminalizing or decriminalizing certain drugs, do we actually invoke some sort of statute where people are forced in order to benefit from certain services, they're forced to, prevent, to present a record of vaccination. You must present your record of vaccination at the same time that you present your tax report from 2014. Is, is this a route that we have to go down? Now, of course, any of these that you go through, people are gonna scream, people are gonna shout, oh, you're muzzling the press, uh, you're preventing freedom of speech, you are taking away our free will, but what is the answer? How do you reason with any of these three groups that what they're doing is right or what they're doing is wrong? Interesting thing is a lot of people, sort of doomsayers and whatnot, have been saying that we are on the brink of another epidemic, something that's going to make the pandemic at the end of World War I look like a picnic. Um, and we've had a few close calls. Um, we've had Ebola recently. This weekend at Sunnybrook Hospital, we had a little issue with a little scare with Ebola, not too far from here. Imagine Ebola starts running around Canada, okay? Um, would be good if we had a vaccine for it, a good way of venting ourselves. We do. We do have a preliminary vaccine that works for Ebola. So ask yourselves now, these people who are refusing measles vaccines, measles which has a 0.2% mortality, are they gonna change their minds for Ebola which has a 50% mortality? Is that thinking static or is it fluid? Is it dynamic? Does it change with the situation? It did for H1N1. The use of vaccinations went up. Will it for other diseases? So before we think of our future world, 
we need to think about our future mentality and how it relates to our present health and our present lives. Thanks very much.